So uh, consider some matrix A of the form, let's say, 3, 2, minus 2, minus 1. I think this is the one I want us to think about. Yeah, let's think about this guy. And the question I want us to answer today is simply, what is E to the A? So the exponential function is defined for numbers, for real numbers. We can also define it for complex numbers. But, but how do you do like E to, to some function, to, to e, uh, some function of a matrix, E to, to the A, right? So any thoughts? How, how can we do this? Hmm? Yeah, OK, that's the right answer. But first, let's give a wrong answer so we can feel like we built up to something, right? So what, what you might do is you might be like, oh, let's just add each, let's just like take each entry and do e to each entry, right? So, so you might be like, oh, maybe, maybe we should define it this way. It's like, it's simple, but it's dumb. And it's like, what's the problem of defining it this way? Well, this doesn't really respect the structure of a matrix, right? Like, yes, it respects the values, but the reason we might be a little bit offended by that is when you think about just something like a squared, we don't define a squared to be just entry, each entry squared, right? It's not like it's just three squared minus two squared, two squared minus one squared. Like, that's not how we define a squared. Instead, we define a squared by this, you know, interplay of the rows and the columns and doing that, your matrix multiplication. Row times column gives you whew, 9 minus 4, which is 5. Row times column gives you negative 2 and neg uh, negative 6 and positive 2, which is minus 4. Did I get that right? Row times column is 6 minus 2, which is positive 4. Row times column is minus 4 times uh, minus four plus one, which is minus three. Does that look right? I think I did that right. Ah, oh, very good. So, so this is, you know, when we do matrix multiplication, it's not just squaring each entry. We actually want to somehow respect the structure a little bit more of the matrix, and we want to respect how we define matrix multiplication. After all, the whole point of this course has been like matrix multiplication is a meaningful thing. Like matrices encode linear transformation, and multiplication between matrices is encoding co um, compositions of linear uh, combination of, of linear transformations. And so it's like we want to respect that story. So we shouldn't just raise each entry. So what do we do instead? Well, exactly what was just said. We we know that the function e to the x. We know that e to the x can be written as a Taylor series. So we have this Taylor series expansion. Right, this is like where you cover in calculus two, right? Where let's say we expand it about the point zero. This, this would be just e to the zero, e to the zero, plus, then you do the derivative of e to the x, which is just well, the div is all e, so this isn't very interesting. It's just e to the 0 over uh, 1 factorial times x, plus the derivative is still e to the x, so it's e to the 0 over 2 factorial times x squared. And so this just simplifies, and you get the really nice series, 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. That infinite series, right? More generally, if you want to expand about some point A, so some, some value A, you, you don't have to do around 0. You can pick some some number a that's, you know, whatever value a you want, could actually be any complex number you want, doesn't even have to be real, expand about i or whatever, then this is just going to be of the form e to the a plus the derivative e to the x, which is, well, still e to the a over one factorial times x minus a, plus uh, the derivative e to the x is still e to the a over two factorial, times x minus a squared, and so on forever, right? Do you remember this a little bit, these Taylor expansions? 
So, so let me just remind you in general what this looks like. Given some function f of x, in general, the Taylor series expansion about some number a is just f of a plus the derivative of f at a times x minus a plus the second derivative of f at a over 2 factorial. There's a 1 factorial there, but that's just 1. There's a 0 factorial here, but that's just 0 times x minus a squared, and so on, right? That is, you can write this as just the sum of the jth derivative of f at a divided by j factorial times x minus a to the j, where j goes from 0 off to infinity. That's our Taylor series. OK, the Taylor expansion of a function. Now, a big portion of calculus two is thinking about like, oh, when does the Taylor series actually converge to your function, right? So, so maybe a word that you may have heard before, or maybe not, is we say that this is analytic if it converges to f of x, right? So analytic is just a word meaning that the series converges. And, and then what you might remember from, you know, calculus two, or maybe you've seen this in some analysis course or something, is that um, these, these converge on like some open interval, right? So if you're working on the reals, it's like you have some a, and then you find the radius of convergence. Remember all that, right? And you have some open interval. And so for some functions, the radius may be infinite, and it may converge for all real numbers. Um, but you can also do it for complex numbers. Instead of an open interval, you have an open ball. And so, and so in general, these, these converge um, you know, on some open ball. So, so converge um, on some open ball. Centered at A. Centered at X equals A. And I'm saying um, ball just because if we're in the complex plane, then you know your two dimensions, and so your ball is something like this, right? Okay. Is this familiar? I mean, feel vaguely comfortable with Taylor series, and you've talked about this, and this isn't this isn't disturbing you too much. If you ever like forget this, like one little hack you can do is you can just be like, okay, when I plug in a to the left hand side, it should equal the right hand side, and these all vanish. The x minus a terms all vanish, so they're equal. Or if I take a derivative and then plug in a, what happens? Taking the derivative, he vanishes, and this goes away. It's just one, and everything else um, when you plug in a then vanishes. So you just have f prime of a, which agrees. And so this is really designed so that. If you plug in A or you take a few derivatives and plug in A, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. And so sometimes there's a little mnemonic you can use to try and remind yourself of how these are expanded. Anyway, the point is, now that we can define functions in terms of just sums of powers of things, let's do that for something like E to a matrix, A. Right? What I want to do is I want to say, that e to the a will just be defined as the analogous thing with matrices, right? So, so instead of being some x, we're now plugging in a matrix. I want to say that this is just going to be, well, what would 1 be? What's the analogy for 1 for us? Identity matrix, that's right. So this should just be 1 uh, identity matrix plus, and then it's like, here's an x, so that's just a copy of a plus here's x squared and you have a, a factor you're scaling by, so it's 1 over 2 factorial times a squared plus 1 over 3 factorial times a cubed, and so on. Right? That's what we want to say e to the a is. And then analogously, we're going to be able to define other kinds of functions, things like, I don't know, sine of a or cosine of a, which also have series expansions. 
So in general, we're going to define if we're given some matrix uh, square matrix and we also given some analytic function so some function f from complex numbers to complex numbers where that function is analytic on some ball centered at you know whatever point you want at some point a we want to say so centered at some point a we're going to say that f of a matrix is exactly where you get when you just plug a into this formula the matrix a into this formula it's the sum of the jth derivative of your function determined at a divided by j factorial this is a number this is a scalar times your matrix a minus well we have to be careful it's like how do you subtract a scalar from a matrix you're like well that's secretly a times one or a times identity right a your matrix a minus your scalar a times the identity to the jth power where j is running from zero to infinity so so this is just a matrix this is a matrix to some power times by a scalar right so this is just a sum of complex scalars times powers of matrices so this is well defined this makes sense right okay just like above we have defined e to the a to be this thing okay when, when you write something like this like you might remember from calculus 2 or whatever analysis class you've done it's like the big worry you now have worries about convergence like worries of this thing is well defined and if you like pick different a's for instance different scalar a's that they converge to the same thing right so these are the kinds of worries you have in an analysis course um, I don't want to worry about that too much because you know there's a reason I don't teach an analysis course I don't like that stuff right <laughs> but but like that is a worry you should have and and so in, in a couple of minutes what we're going to transition to is we're going to give some better formula for this right and, and we're going to see like well, once we have a precise algorithm it'll be actually independent of your choice of a so regardless of which point you pick as long as it converges it will converge to the same thing right so so we'll address that worry that you might secretly have but we really do need to do that because like right now although we've given like a definition for e to the a it's like how are you going to calculate that thing right like that's a mess so it's like good luck right there's like a lot to calculate like infinitely many terms so so we want some better way to to like actually determine what e to the a is and and i don't know maybe you have some clever way of figuring out some pattern of what the like if, if a is like a two by two matrix maybe you can determine like the upper left you know some formula for the upper left value of like a to the n and maybe you could solve this like in tree rise but in general like this is very hard to do right so so we want something that's going to help us and so it's like well what's the thing that's going to help us and you're like well, what just like think about where we spent the last couple of lectures talking about maybe there's a reason we spend all this time talking about jordan canonical forms and so what i want us to do is see how thinking about a Jordan decomposition will actually give us a much nicer way to quickly, very quickly determine what e to the a is with Jordan decompositions. Um, maybe before I do that though, before I build up to Jordan decompositions, I want you to think about just a special case. And, and that's if you have a diagonal matrix. So let's say we have some diagonal matrix D that just has you know diagonal entries d1 down through let's call it dn 
Let's say we have a diagonal matrix, right? Okay, well, what are the powers of D then? The powers of D, like D to any power, just comes out to be those diagonal entries to that power, right? Because when you multiply him by itself, you just get the D1 times D1, the D2 times the D2, and so forth. So this is just D1 to the K down through Dn to the K. And, and so let's try and like think about like an example of something like if you have E to the D. Well, you could write that out like here, where you're like, this is just identity plus D plus one over two factorial D squared plus you know one over three factorial D cubed and so forth. But like now your powers of D are really well behaved things. It's just your diagonal entries to whatever power. And so if we want to represent this whole thing as a single matrix, we like know what's going to happen in the entries. The top left entry, this time we actually can do it. Like, Identity is just going to contribute a one. D is just going to contribute a copy of D1. This is going to contribute a copy of one over two factorial D1 squared, right? And you exactly get the series expansion with just D1 plugged in. Or if you think about like the lower right entry, you'll have one from the identity plus a copy of you know, Dn plus one over two factorial dn squared, so forth. And so your diagonal entries just become the series expansion at the dk, you know, d1, d2, d3, down through dn, and zeros everywhere else. But it's like, what is this? What is that guy right there? Yeah, that really is just e to the d1. So here, it really does just come out to be e to the d1 down through e to the dn on the diagonal and zeros of else. And so it's like, okay, so for a diagonal matrix, you really can just do e to the diagonal just raising each of those values e to that value, right? It's like, the thing that you want to do with a matrix, be like, that was too dumb. Well, it's not too dumb when it works with, because it, it does work for diagonal matrices, because that's exactly the powers of diagonal matrices work. And more generally, If you have some analytic function f, f of d just comes out to be f of d1 down through f of dn, zeros ever else. It's the exact same argument, but you just do it in general with you know, this um, Taylor expansion for whatever, f, whatever f's Taylor expansion looks like. Right? So you're like, OK, so diagonal matrices are really nice. Right, like those, those are really nice to play with. But we're interested, well, it's like the problem is not all matrices can be expressed as a diagonal matrix. Not all matrices are similar to a diagonal matrix. That's why we have this whole Jordan canonical form where we write things that have a diagonal, but then we also have a super diagonal with ones, right? And so what I want to do is take a second to think about just what work, what happens to these powers what happens to these powers if you have some matrix that has a super diagonal of ones? And so for simplicity, I'm just gonna make my diagonals all zeros. This is like the simplest case we, we can do. The diagonal is all zeros, and then I'm gonna have your super diagonal of all ones. So, so here I just have ones, which is just one above the diagonal, right? And zeros everywhere else. So, so this is my matrix N. Um, Let's say this is like a, I don't know, uh, a K by K matrix, I'll call it, or an N by N matrix, or whatever size I want this to be, let's call it an M by N matrix. So maybe I'll denote this like N sub N. So this is just the matrix that's ones along the super diagonal. So let's just think for a moment. Uh, this is gonna get a little bit messy. I think I should do a concrete example. Let me do N4. I think, I think that'll let you really see what's going on here. So like, let's do N4. Let me draw a four by four matrix. That has ones 
on the super diagonal. Missed one. There you go. That one's kind of skinny. Okay. Let's think about what happens when we square this guy. What is n4 squared? Right, like if we get some intuition about this, maybe we can get some intuition of what happens when we have a matrix that's both diagonal but has some extra stuff on the super diagonal. That's what we're trying to build up to. So help me out, what would n4 squared be? It's like row times column, that's just zero. Row times column, that's just zero. But now when you do row times the third column, you actually get a one, right? Because this one and this one multiply. And then row times the last column is zero. So it's like it's only gonna work when this one lines up with this one. And then for the second one, it's like, when is it gonna be non-zero? Well, if you do second row, it would be non-zero when you times it by the last column. And all the other times, it gives you zeros. And everything else gives you a zero, right? Like this guy, it gives you zeros in times of any column and so forth. Okay, how about we do like n4 cubed? Well, now I want to do a copy of n4 times a copy of n4 squared. So here we go. Row times column, zero. Okay, a lot of zeros. Is there any time it's not zero on the top row? Or is there any time at all when this is non-zero? When? Yeah, if you do the very top row times the rightmost column, this one and this one line up. So we get this. But anywhere else, you get zero. Okay, how about n4 to the fourth? Yeah, like any row times these columns gives you a zero because it's like this first column is all zero so there's no way you know, anything times this one gives you zero. So he just comes out to be zero. Okay, so what's the pattern? The ones get shifted up every time. Yeah, it's just every time you go up a power, you're shifting up where this diagonal of ones are. And this holds in, in general. You can think about it if you have just like a k by k matrix like this. Then we multiply by itself, the ones just get shifted up one, right? So, so okay, maybe that's gonna help us out now. So what we want to do is we want to try and think what's going on here if I have some Jordan form. I want to try and put together you know, a diagonal matrix with this N matrix, which is what the form of some kind of Jordan form is. And so let me just begin with a single Jordan block. You know, we know a, Jordan, a matrix in Jordan form can have many Jordan blocks. But let's just suppose you have some Jordan form that's just a single, a single um, Jordan block. And so let's just say that's Jn of lambda. So like, if you're forgetting what this looks like, I'll just remind you, this is something that has lambdas along the diagonal and then has ones along your super diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So, so we have just a single matrix of this form. And I want us to try and think a little bit about what the Taylor expansion of this is going to look like. And so let's try and calculate f of j, where f is some analytic function. Okay, or analytic on some, some open ball. So it's like, Let's be a little bit strategic. 
open ball centered at A. Well, like what might be a good value of A for us to, to pick? I'm going to make the assumption we're going to assume that this is analytic at lambda. That is, it converges for uh, x equals lambda, for, for your value lambda in the complex numbers. Because if we pick out a to be lambda, things will simplify quite nicely for us. We'll have the sum of the jth derivative of f at lambda divided by j factorial times whatever your matrix A is, uh, which is for us j, minus lambda times the identity to the jth power, where little j is running from 0 to infinity. But notice what happens here. When you do lambda minus a j minus lambda times the identity, we're just going to be killing off these lambdas. And so we're left with just a super diagonal of ones. So what results here is just some matrix N, uh, an N by N matrix N, just like we had seen. And we've already talked about what happens when you raise this to the J power. You just end up with your diagonal of ones moving higher and higher and higher, right? So, so let's just like draw a picture of what this is going to end up being. We, we now have zeros along the main diagonal. And I have ones on my super diagonal. So when j equals zero, ah, actually when j equals zero, what happens? When j equals zero, this collapses down to identity. So when j equals zero, I have identity, so that gives me ones on the diagonal. And the identity is getting multiplied by what? What's your scalar here when j is zero? Well, it's just f of lambda. So on the diagonal, you just have f of lambda. f of lambda, f of lambda, f of lambda, down your diagonal. But now let's let j equal 1. So what happens when j equals 1? Now this is just 1's on the super diagonal. And those 1's on the super diagonal are getting multiplied by the first derivative of f of lambda. So f prime of lambda ends up being on your super diagonal. And then it's like, okay, what happens if you have j equals 2? This is squared, so we just set a super diagonal, it moves up 1. And j is 2, so you're doing the second derivative divided by 2 factorial. So on the next higher diagonal, you have the second derivative of lambda divided by 2 factorial. You know, it's like the second derivative of f at lambda divided by 2 factorial. And, and you just continue this way, right? Until you fill up your matrix, however big your matrix is. Because at some point, when you get to n, this becomes 0. And, and then you stop. You're not changing your matrix by anything, by anything. And so you, know, you just continue this however large your matrix is. So maybe this warrants an example. So, you know, let's pick something for it to be our matrix J. I don't know. Let's, let's make our matrix J be something like the matrix. Let's get pi's. Let's do sine and cosine. That'd be kind of fun. Pi, 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 a 4 by 4. And we'll have some super diagonal. So let's suppose we have some matrix like this. And suppose I want to calculate what is sine of j. So 
we have instructions now, zeros everywhere else. What this will come out to be is it's just going to be along the diagonal sine of your lambda, sine of pi. So on your diagonal, this is just sine of pi. Okay, help me out. What is it going to be the next diagonal up? Zero is everywhere else. Zero is down here in the lower triangular portion. What's going to be on the super diagonal? Sine? Yeah, cosine of still pi. Right. So here we'll have cosine of pi. Okay, and then if we move up a diagonal, what do we have? <coughs> Derivative of cosine is negative sine, but we have to have to scale by this two factorial. So it's minus one half sine. So we have minus one half sine of pi. We have minus one half sine of pi. And what's gonna be up here? Well, yeah, the derivative of sine is cosine, so it's minus cosine, but now it's three factorials, so it's a six, so it's minus one-sixth, minus one-sixth cosine of pi, right? That's what this is telling us. And, and then you can just simplify this. Um, at pi, your sine is zero, and at pi, your cosine is negative one, so we just have zeros along this diagonal, and we have negative ones on the super diagonal, and then zeros again, and then cosine is negative one, but it's negative, negative one, then we have a one-sixth. So here is what sine of j comes out to be. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't have expected that. Like, how do you go from there to there? But this, this is what we just showed. Okay, are we happy with that? The problem is, like, not every matrix though looks like J, <laughs> right? Like, I have that matrix we started with. All right, erased it now, like three minus two, two minus one. So what we want to do now is we want to extend this more generally. It's like, well, not every matrix looks like J, but every matrix is similar to something that looks like things built up of J's. So our D Jordan decomposition that we discussed the last two lectures tells us that for any A square matrix complex entries, you can write A up to some change of basis as J where your J is made up of these Jordan blocks. J, K1 through J, K, M with some, you know, lambda one through sub lambda M zeros ever else, right? So let's use this to now try and think about what the analytic expansion would be if we, if we use this decomposition. So I'm trying to figure out what is f of a, but we're gonna say f of a is just f of pj, p inverse, using our Jordan decomposition. And then this will just come out to be the sum from j equals zero to infinity of the j derivative of f at some point a all over j factorial times P j p inverse minus a times the identity to the jth power. And now like we want to think a little bit. It's like, okay, how can we simplify our lives? Well, here I want to pull out a p and a p inverse. So the first move is going to be to recognize this here 
is the same thing as P times J minus AI to the J times P inverse. Why? Well, you know, you just think about like when you multiply him by a copy of himself, you, you can, well, on the inside, you can, you can first do this on the inside. This inside of this guy is just P times J minus AI times P inverse all to the jth power, right? Because that P and the P inverse times I is still I. And then when you raise this to the jth power, you're just stringing these next to each other. So the P and P inverses cancel in the middle and you're just left with one P at the beginning and one P inverse at the end. And J copies of the centerpiece. And then this is just a scalar. So I can rewrite this as P times, bring the scalars inside, the sum of um, the J derivative of F evaluated A divided by um, J factorial times this matrix J minus AI, which let me write that as a matrix. So J minus AI would be your first block up here minus a copy of AI down through your last block down here times a copy of AI where j goes from zero to infinity, and then that whole thing times p inverse. But now, here's just a sum of scalars times matrices, and you can bring the scalars inside, move the sum inside, just adding it component-wise. And so we're just summing this expression right here. It's just the sum of the scalars times this, um, all the way down to this. Oh, oh, did I forget? I forgot to do powers. This is to the jth power. Okay, may maybe I should write this as one more step. So this is just P times, this is um, a block diagonal. I, I have these matrices forming these blocks along the diagonal. And so this to the jth power would just be whatever he is to the jth power. J, K, 1, lambda 1 minus A, I to the jth power, down through whatever this guy is down here to the jth power, J, K, M, lambda M minus A, I to the jth power. And then I'm going to move inside the scalars in the sum. So times a sum of the jth derivative of F Evaluate at A over J factorial all the way down here to the sum of the J derivative of F evaluate at A all over J factorial. And then finally at the end I have a P inverse. Woo! Okay. That is just to say, since this is just block diagonals, it plays very nicely with powers and sums. Right? So you just end up with, well, what is this? Well, I've already said this is this expression we had over there. That was exactly our definition of just f of j. And we know how to calculate f of j. This just comes out to be p times f of your j k1 lambda 1 down through f of your j k m lambda m times p inverse. And so like all, all this is saying is if you want to calculate f of a, write its Jordan decomposition, and then for each block, just do like we did to this block. You should do it block by block, and then you can multiply it out and you're done. So let me just show you this, show you this in practice. So we're still going to be following this rule here for our blocks. But you know, let's, let's think of like a concrete example. 
So the, the example we, we opened class with today is I had a equals, there's still like a, a remnant of it, a equals three, two, minus two, minus one. And if we find the Jordan decomposition for that, the Jordan decomposition just comes out to be, let me, let me find it, I did it out the other night. Do, 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 do. Here we go. It just comes out to be two, one, two, zero. That's my P. My J just was one, one, zero, one. So it's a single Jordan block with lambda being one. And then P inverse, which uh, here, we don't need all this anymore. And then P inverse, which is just the inverse of this guy. So um, and times by uh, one over the derivative. So it comes out being this, I believe. Does that look right? These switch place, these change signs, but then you have to divide it all by negative two. I think that's good, right? Negative two, so negative, yeah, that's good. Okay, so how do we do this? Like how do we calculate e to the a? What this is telling us is all you need to do is instead do that this p times e to this j times p inverse. That's what the theorem says. That's what our result says. And, and we know how to do e to the j. When you have something like this, e to the j is just, it's like you follow your directions. You do e of your lambda values. So it's like e to the one, e to the one. And then one diagonal up, it's the derivative of e to the x with your lambda value. The derivative of e to the x is still e to the x, so it's still e to the one up here. So it's still e to the one. If these had been twos, that would still be an e to the two. This one is not coming from this one, right? This one is from the fact that my lambda, here my lambda equals one. And so I'm plugging in one to e to the x and to the derivative of e to the x. And then you're just timesing that by your p and your p inverse. And you can just do that out. But you look at this and you're like, what just happened? Well, in this particular case, I just scaled this matrix by a copy of E, just E's here. So if you just pull out that scalar E, you're back to the original matrix J that you had. And so you just picked up a scalar copy of E, so you really just ended up with E times A. This doesn't usually happen. This is kind of a weird case, right? But, but that's, that's what this comes out to be. It's just you pick up a scalar multiple of E from doing this. But like you can do other things too, right? Like, like what if you want to calculate, say, the square root of A? Well, what, what this formula is telling us you just do P times the square root of J times P inverse. So like, let's think about what is the square root of J here? Well, what we do, according to this, is we do the square root function with one plugged in, lambda equals one on the diagonal. So plug in one to your square root, you just get one. Then what goes here? Well, the derivative of the square root function, that's one over two root x, one over two square roots of x. But my x here is my lambda, lambda equals one. So what I end up with is one half in that corner. Good. And if it was a bigger matrix, you would just do more derivatives, you know. And if there were several blocks, you would do it for each block separately. And then my P is still 2, 2, 1, 0. And my P inverse is still 1, uh, 0, 1 half, 1 minus 1 half. And so I end up with, oh, you know, multiply these out. What do you get? I'll just give you the spoiler. I did last night. It's, it just comes out to be two minus one, one zero. You can multiply those out. And you should check that if you square this thing, you get back to your original A. You do, right? Like this row times this column is four minus one. That gives you the three and so forth. Okay. So we now know how to calculate, you know, just about whatever you want. Uh, I guess I should end 
by giving you a little bit of a warning. Like, warning, things don't always end so, like, go, go so nicely. Like, what if I want to find the square root of b, where my b is equal to the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0? Well, it's like, this is already a Jordan block. This is just a Jordan block where lambda is 0. Right? Zero is with a 1 on the superdiagonal. So this should just be, according to a formula, you plug in 0 into the square root. So it's going to be like square root 0, square root 0. But then right here, you take the derivative of the square root, so 1 over 2 times the square root, and you plug in 0. And like, uh oh, dividing by 0. This is not defined. Right? This is undefined. So it's like, this, this failed. Why does it fail? Well, it's that convergence thing. It, it turns out that my you know, eigenvalue here is 0, and my, my um, function is, isn't analytic at 0. So it's not going to converge at 0. Right? And, and so this is actually undefined. We just can't define the square root of b. So, so from some functions, you have convergence problems that when you try this out, you'll run into issues like this. That's fine, which means it's not defined there. Okay, but now that you have this, like any problem set, you'll, you prove some cool things. Um, I don't remember all the ones I, you prove, but one thing you can prove is like sine squared of a plus cosine squared of a. This follows immediately from what we've shown today. What do you think this should come out to be? A density for any matrix A. Like, whoa, that's cool. Or, or you show something like the determinant of E to the A comes out to be E to the trace of A. So you get the, these are scalars. This is a number, right? This, this is a matrix, but the determinant of the matrix gives you a number. This is E to a number, so these are both numbers. And you show, like, you get all these cool identity relationships. And you can just extend, it's pretty much like, if things hold true for numbers, they largely hold true for, for matrices as well. There's some exceptions, right? But we've just been able to extend all these results from, from scalars to matrices. So we'll end there.